Good evening. Good evening. They, they certainly gave us a great night to have this uh, uh, first event of our 33rd year of the Dr. Harold Deutsch Roundtable in a new venue. But uh, our, our speaker this evening, our historian, and really a great friend of mine personally and the round table. Uh, Flint Whitlock is, uh, uh, I think this is his fourth time to come to Minnesota. And the two trips that we've led to Italy for the staff rides, he has been our guide for that. And uh, uh, I, I can't say enough uh, about uh, Flint. Uh, 64 graduate, Illinois. Spent five years on active duty uh, with a year in Vietnam. Uh, his uh, father was a 10th Mountain Division veteran, fought up through Italy, and that was the topic of his first book. Uh, he has been very active in the Colorado uh, history scene with the 45th. I, the, the first time we had him out, and I had him out in January. <laughs> Flint said, you got to bring me out next time, or the next time on better weather. So. It's, it, this is a 10 tonight, Flint. He is the uh, editor of the World War II Quarterly, and I'm sure that uh, he'll help us with uh, getting subscriptions. If We should have gotten some subscription forms to, for tonight. But Flint does a wonderful job with that, and uh, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I encourage you to buy those on the newsstand if you don't have a subscription. Uh, he's appeared with... Uh, uh, War Stories with Oliver North, documentaries uh, with the 10th Mountain, uh, with uh, the uh, leading battlefield tours for the Smithsonian, National Geographic, and the World War II Roundtable. Flint, welcome to a 10-day, welcome to the Roundtable, welcome to our 33rd year, and the podium is yours, sir. Thank you, Don. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to be here, especially with the weather being what it was today. Um, no snow, no ice. That was wonderful. Uh, as Don said, this is my fourth time that I've addressed the round table here in uh, the Twin Cities. And uh, each time it's, it's uh, exciting because you people uh, are such a great audience and you do such a wonderful job supporting what uh, Don does and, and Doug Rainey and all the other board members of the round table. Um, I, I've never known anybody as dedicated to a, a, an organization as Don is. I mean, it, I don't know how he, he finds time for his regular job of being an astronaut, but uh, <laughs> some, some, somehow he does that. Um, in 1998, my first book about the Battle of Anzio was published. Now, 21 years later, my second book about the Battle of Anzio was recently published. Now, why did I find it necessary to write two books about basically the same topic? And what could I find out that was different from the first one? Well, what I found could fill a book, and it actually did. But first, let's cover the big picture. What, when, and where was the Battle of Anzio? We'll start with a little geography. In September 1943, combined American and British forces in the U.S. 5th Army and the British 8th Army launched uh, their uh, assaults and invasion of Italy, uh, the Americans. And the 5th Army was actually made up of Americans and British units. Uh, they landed here at, at Salerno. The rest of the British Army under Field Marshal Montgomery landed here at Toronto, and together they began moving up the, uh, the peninsula of Italy uh, through the Apennine Mountains that form the rocky spine of Italy. Not surprisingly, the tough, battle-hardened Germans opposed them every step of the way. As you can see, the terrain of central Italy is a lot like uh, Minnesota. Oh, no, wait, this is, <laughs> this is uh, actually Italy. Uh, some of the most mountainous terrain you'll find anywhere. It's also intercut with numerous uh, rapidly flowing rivers. To compound the problems, 
The winter weather in Italy can be nasty, capable of slowing an advancing army to a halt while providing aid to a defending force. In addition to the weather and terrain, the Allied advance became totally stalled when it came up against a series of well-fortified German defensive lines, which ran the width of Italy. And uh, you can see some of them here in black, the Hitler line, the Bernhard line, the Barber line, uh, and f through, through Rome, there was a Caesar line. The main one is the Gustav line, which began over here on the, west co on the east coast of Italy and worked its way through Casino uh, to, the, uh, to the sea on the uh, western side of Italy. It was anchored by the ancient Benedictine monastery atop Monte Cassino. The fighting along the Gustav line was brutal and the Germans were determined to hold on to every foot of real estate. Once the stalemate began in October of 1943, Fifth Army Commander Mark Clark began to conceive of an end run, an amphibious end run around the western flank of the Gustav line that would land in the vicinity of Anzio, which is only 40 miles south of Rome. Clark's boss, Field Marshal Harold Alexander, liked the idea too and proposed it to British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who also became very enthusiastic about it and became the operation's primary, uh, the prime mover and cheerleader for the operation. Everyone thought that a landing behind uh, German lines would so frighten the German commander in Italy, Albert Kesselring, that he would pull his troops out of the Gustav line and hightail it for the Alps. The place chosen for the landing were the twin coastal resort towns of Anzio and Nettuno, located just 40 miles south of Rome. Anzio had been a resort town for centuries, and uh, even the Emperor Nero had a luxurious seaside villa at Anzio, which was called Antium in ancient times. The three Allied leaders were convinced that such a landing behind enemy lines had the possibility of putting Allied troops into Rome within a week or two, thus breaking the stalemate and turning the tide of war in Italy. So the decision was made to launch the operation, codenamed Shingle, on, operation, on January 22nd, 1944, before more naval assets and troops could be withdrawn from the Mediterranean theater and sent to Britain for the anticipated invasion of France at Normandy. The fact that there weren't enough troops or landing craft to adequately support such an operation didn't seem to bother anyone except Major General John Lucas, whose Sixth Corps was selected to make the invasion. Lucas, knowing that his forces were inadequate and worn out from months of fighting, realized that uh, the the Sixth Corps, when he led it at Salerno, was almost tossed back into the sea by the Germans. And he worried that the same thing could and would happen at Anzio. Inexplicably excluded from the planning and decision-making sessions, Lucas was pessimistic about Shingle's chances. But like the professional soldier he was, he said, yes, sir, and proceeded to try and carry out his assignment. So in the early hours of January 22nd, 36,000 soldiers of the American 3rd Infantry Division and British 1st Infantry Division, including a few hundred commandos and rangers and paratroopers, began splashing ashore on the beaches around Anzio and Natuno, expecting that at any moment the Germans would open up on them. Here we see a landing craft of General Lucian Truscott's 3rd Infantry Division discharging troops onto a beach codenamed X-Ray, south of Natuno. But except for a little sporadic shelling, there was no opposition. Total surprise had been achieved. Although there was a lack of defenders, there was, the main obstacle was a profu profusion of mines that the Germans had in place. Here an engineer is diffusing a few of them. The invasion came off about as smoothly as any in history. Men came ashore, moved inland a few miles, and waited for the inevitable counterattack, which did not come. On the far left flank of the invasion area, the British 1st Division under Major General William Penny started moving out on the road to Rome, less than 40 miles away. You can see the British soldiers here uh, smiling for the cameraman and pointing to the sign that says Rome 
uh, 57.6 kilometers away, which is about 40 miles. A few unlucky Germans in the area were no match for the invaders. The 3rd Division troops moved in against virtually no opposition, but were ordered to halt by Lucas, who feared that he was walking into a trap. The British troops also probed a few miles inland, when they too got the order to halt and dig in in the deep, dry creek beds, reminiscent of the trenches of World War I. The prudent Lucas has forever been blamed for not taking advantage of the complete surprise and for not being more aggressive and setting his forces immediately racing for Rome. But I think by the time I finish tonight, you'll come to the same conclusion that I did, that Lucas was a scapegoat for bad decisions made at the highest levels of command, not to mention circumstances that were beyond his control. We'll talk more in a few minutes about Lucas and why I feel like I've become his uh, defense attorney. Within minutes of being notified that the Allies had landed at Anzio and Natuno, Kesselring, a master of the defense, leapt into action. Instead of pulling out of the Gustav line and retreating northward, he began bringing in forces the Allies didn't know he had, and soon encircled the beachhead with hundreds of tanks and artillery pieces and thousands of combat-hardened men without needing to denude or abandon the Gustav line. Under General Eberhard von Mackensen, 14th Army commander, the Germans launched one human wave attack after another for the next several weeks at the Yanks and Tommies, hoping to break the Allied line. This photo gives you an idea of what much of the terrain around Anzio looks like. Flat, open, very little cover or concealment, the perfect killing ground for both sides. And kill both sides did. Night and day, the Germans pummeled the closely packed beachhead with hundreds of artillery pieces, including these giant rail car mounted guns dubbed Anzio Annie and the Anzio Express. They were actually the heavy guns off of German battleships that had been fitted uh, onto railroad cars, and they had a range of about 40 miles. The Luftwaffe too, although outnumbered, ceaselessly bombed Allied positions, including the big clearly marked field hospitals that were well within range. In fact, there would eventually be four hospitals at Anzio, all packed into a very small, open, and vulnerable area. Here you see the damage caused by one of the raids. Many patients, doctors, and nurses were killed in these attacks. The Luftwaffe also employed remote-controlled glide bombs, today's, you know, forerunners of today's cruise missiles, to attack Allied ships in Anzio Harbor. The entrenched allies met every German assault with an incredible expenditure of munitions, from mortars and artillery, to machine guns and small arms fire, to hundreds of bombers, to naval guns lying off the coast. The Germans paid a heavy price for their continued attacks. It was a slaughter, and no one should discount the bravery of the German soldier. Meanwhile, a hundred miles to the south near Naples, Clark and Alexander had their headquarters in the opulent palace at Caserta, which is larger than the palace of Versailles in France. Here the generals and their staffs, far from the sounds of the guns, were surrounded by luxury that boggles the mind. Dining in splendor on meals prepared by the finest chefs from London and New York that were on their staffs. While the soldiers in the field, uh, their dining arrangements were a little less luxurious and the living accommodations could be, it could be said, left a little to be desired. Even the nurses at the hospitals were required to dig holes for their own protection. Some soldiers, like these British troops, use a bit of sardonic wit to deal with the fact that they were, as one soldier put it, living like rats in the mud. The cartoonist and humorist Bill Malden, who served at Anzio with the 45th Division, the Colorado and Oklahoma National Guard, said, Mud is a special curse that seems to save itself for wartime. I'm sure Europe never got this muddy in peacetime. Even General Lucas at Anzio had to have his headquarters deep underground in a wine cellar to stay safe from the relentless shelling. Here's the aftermath of one such German shelling attack outside Six Corps headquarters. On the eastern flank of the beachhead, General Lucian Truscott's 3rd Infantry Division was tasked with the taking of the city of Cisterna. Now, we Americans, we call it Cisterna. The Italians call it Cisterna. Little Italian lesson 
tonight. An objective that, despite constant attempts, would elude the Americans for four months. It was here that Darby's Ranger Force, leading the attack on Chisterna, was ambushed and destroyed. Only a handful of men out of over 700 who went into the attack returned. The rest were either killed or captured. Here you see some of the captured rangers being paraded through Rome by the Germans. Besides Cisterna, the small town of, of Aprilia, as we would call it, or Aprilia, as the Italians say it, about 10 miles north of Anzio, and located on the main highway uh, to Rome, became another of the main focal points of the battle. Aprilia was sometimes called the factory because the twin towers that looked like industrial smokestacks. Aprilia had been the brainchild of the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. In fact, several towns in the area were designated model fascist towns. Mussolini encouraged his regime's architects to, to embrace the new Art Deco style that was popular in the 1920s and 30s in an interesting attempt to reconcile the ancient Roman tradition and the most advanced modernism. Here's an example of that style, a building in Mussolini's new Rome called EUR which is a bustling community today. In fact, EUR stands as an architectural example of what much of Italy and Germany probably would have looked like had the Axis powers won the war. In the Anzio area, the Pontine Marshes had for centuries been a swampy place inhabited mostly by malaria-carrying mosquitoes. Mussolini wanted the swamp drained so that the area could become agriculturally productive. He had the Mussolini Canal constructed to do just that. And to attract settlers, he commissioned architects to design a series of modernistic villages on the reclaimed land. Here are a few examples. This is uh, Predapio, which is Mussolini's birthplace, Sobaudia, Pomezia, Tresigalo, Litoria, today known as Latina, and Aprilia. This is an architectural model of Aprilia designed by the firm uh, 2PST that won the contract. Here's Aprilia during the construction phase and uh, another shot of the house of fascism, the tower there, and photographs of some of the principal buildings. And here's Mussolini on the left driving a tractor during the town's dedication ceremonies in 1937. And here he is during the dedication of the town, accompanied by Nazi Germany's Rudolf Hess, who's right here, Mussolini and Hess, who was the deputy Fuhrer of Germany. During some of the hardest fighting of the entire Anzio campaign, Aprilia changed hands several times, and the fighting in its rubble-strewn streets was often hand-to-hand. -hand. Here's Aprilia before the battle, and this is what was left of it after the battle ended. Here you can see German armor, as well as a knocked out Sherman tank in the neighboring town of Carocetto. In the distance you can see Aprilia, the two towers there. Heavy fighting also took place south of Aprilia at a place called the Overpass by the Americans and the flyover by the British. This was a crucial terrain feature because it was where the Germans had to break through the Allied lines in order to split the British and Americans, and push them back into the sea. This map shows the location of the overpass that spanned the highway and railway line from Anzio. So this is the highway and railroad line running parallel uh, through the overpass, and Aprilia is here, and then the road angles off towards Rome. This is a closer view of the battered overpass, and one more shot. But here, as with everywhere along the Allied line, the British and Americans held firm, tearing the German ranks to pieces and leaving the battlefield strewn with hundreds of German corpses, as well as many Allied soldiers who paid the ultimate price for their leaders' miscalculations. During the height of the battle, elements of the 45th Division formed a thin line of defense in front of the overpass against repeated German infantry and armor assaults and was forced to hold out in a series of caves while being surrounded and relentlessly attacked by the enemy. Most of these troops were either killed or captured. The intensity of the attacks could not be sustained indefinitely, so when at last the German assaults slackened in mid-February, General Lucas, 
tired and stressed out, as well as the target of intense criticism from his superiors, was replaced by General Clark at the urging of Alexander as commander of Sixth Corps. I should also mention that in one of his speeches, the furious Churchill singled out Lucas for criticism, saying that, I thought we were hurling a wildcat onto the beach and all we got was a stranded whale. That's my Churchill impression, thank you. <laughs> Taking over Sixth Corps was Lucian Truscott, the aggressive and dynamic commander of the 3rd Infantry Division. Assuming command of the 3rd Division then was Major General John Iron Mike O'Daniel, whose face alone was enough to scare the enemy into surrendering. <laughs> now that's a, that's a warrior's face. Reminds me of Don. <laughs> but Kesselring and Mackinson never gave up their efforts to shove the Allies back into the sea. For the next three months, Sixth Corps absorbed every punishment that the Germans could throw at them. Time and again, the Germans came at the British and the Americans, expecting to crack the line, but failing every time. Meanwhile, to dislodge the Germans from the Gustav Line and its linchpin, the Abbey of Monte Cassino, the Allies resorted to bombing the Abbey and the town below into rubble, but still the Germans up there held firm. As the months wore on, Allied strength slowly increased as the Allies prepared for the breakout from the beachhead and at the Gustav Line. On May 11, 1944, the Allied troops down along the Gustav Line began their long-awaited violent attempt to finally break through the German defenses. This time, the fourth major attack on this line, they were successful, and the Abbey fell to two divisions of Polish troops who were part of the British Eighth Army. General Heinrich von Wietinghoff was ordered by Kesselring to pull his 10th Army troops out of the Gustav Line and conduct a fighting withdrawal toward Rome. Here, Polish troops are taking prisoner a few of the German paratroopers who had held Monte Cassino for four months. Here's a look at the Polish war cemetery behind the abbey where hundreds of troops who stormed Monte Cassino are buried. On May 24th, it became the turn of Truscott's Sixth Corps to finally break out of the Anzio beachhead and begin the rush to Rome. One captured German soldier said that the breakout was the most vicious thing he had ever seen, even worse than the time he had spent on the Eastern Front. For a week, the fighting was intense and bloody, but the Allies made slow and steady progress. Here's a map of the breakout. We have Anzio over here and Sixth Corps and the directions that the various divisions moved out along the Gustav line here and the Hitler line. Uh, the German 10th Army was pushed back by the Polish Corps, uh, Eighth Corps, the French Corps, Second Corps, all going in the direction of Rome up here. The Germans fought for every foot of ground, leaving dozens of towns like Velletri and Valamantone shattered in their wake. The city of Cisterna, or what was left of it, finally fell to the 3rd Infantry Division. The destruction of Cisterna was total. Here you see some of Cisterna's stunned defenders who were forced to surrender. Enemy soldiers by the thousands were rounded up and sent off to POW cages. Now these guys may look tough, and defiant, but no doubt they were glad to be alive and out of the fighting. Now Clark had one goal in mind, for his American Fifth Army to take Rome without the help of the British, not even the British who were part of his Fifth Army. Blasting their way through every obstacle that the retreating Germans could establish, the Yanks fought against rearguard elements who tried to delay the entrance of the Americans long enough for the rest of the German army in Italy to escape to the north and set up new defensive positions. On June 4th, 1944, Clark's Fifth Army, Americans only, no British allowed, captured the Eternal City and claimed the spoils of victory. It was not for several days after the Americans had entered Rome that the British were finally allowed in, much to Alexander's and Churchill's consternation. Two days after Clark entered Rome, the Allied invasion of France was launched and the victory in Italy became yesterday's news. 11 more months of fighting in Italy would still play, take place, and all the hard work and sacrifice by the Allied troops there would take a back seat to the rapid advances across France, Belgium, Holland, and into Nazi Germany itself. 
The casualties incurred during the four-month-long battle at Anzio were heavy, as you can see from this chart. So that's the basic story of Anzio, but wait, there's more. My earlier book, The Rock of Anzio, is the story of the 45th Division, but there was much more I wanted to explore, like detailing the bond between American and British soldiers who fought side by side against the Germans. I also wanted to talk more about the ordeal of Aprilia, the small fascist village of about 2,000 people that was at the heart of much of the bitter fighting in February 1944. The difficult plight of civilians caught up in a war is rarely written about, but I managed to find an account in Italian by Pasqualino Nuti, the son of Aprilia's police chief, who was a young boy during the battle and had a harrowing escape from the town when the battle swept through it. So I've included an account of the battle as seen through the eyes of a nine-year-old child. Here's what the church and town square looked like after the battle. This is the bronze statue of St. Michael standing here with the head of a dragon in his hand. About the only thing that was left standing was this statue, in fact. But here's a recent photo of the center of Aprilia, which has, has come back to life as a major industrial center and now has a population of about 70,000 people. And here's St. Michael still on his pedestal in front of the reconstructed church. This is a shot that was taken in 2015 in Aprilia of the people from this round table who I guided on a battlefield tour at that time. How many of you were on that trip? I know I, I've made contact with several more of you uh, since then. Great, good to see you again. I also wanted to do what I could to restore the reputation of Major General John P. Lucas, commander of Sixth Corps, who was responsible for leading Sixth Corps ashore and who has been, in my view, been made the scapegoat and unfairly blamed for the things that went wrong or at least the things that did not go according to his superior's expectations. Admittedly, he doesn't have the kind of command presence or warrior countenance that uh, Truscott or O'Daniel have that inspires confidence in superiors and subordinates. In fact, his nickname at Anzio was Foxy Grandpa. There's no denying that Lucas was a cautious, prudent officer, not given to wildly aggressive action, not cut from the same mold as, say, George Patton, but he had a strong, caring personal bond with his troops, and he did not want to needlessly expose them to danger. Therefore, thinking that Sixth Corps had walked into a trap, Lucas was reluctant to send it hell-bent for leather towards Rome immediately upon landing. Certainly, his experience leading Sixth Corps in landings at Salerno, where the Germans were waiting and nearly cut the invading force to pieces, played heavily on his and Clark's mind when it came time for shingle. Also, Lucas was inexplicably excluded from the planning sessions for Shingle. Despite his misgivings about the possibility of success at Anzio, his advice was neither sought nor desired. He was handed a vague and faulty plan and told to somehow make it work without sufficient shipping or the numbers of troops needed to make it work. And much of the planning by Clark, Alexander, and Churchill was based on guesses, wrong assumptions, faulty intelligence, and wishful thinking. Everyone assumed that by landing up the coast behind the Gustav Line, Kesselring would panic and withdraw to Rome and beyond, allowing the Allies free access to Rome. The planners also made several more wrong assumptions. They assumed that Kesselring was stretched thin, that no other formations were available to him, when in fact he was able to quickly bring in whole divisions from France, Italy, and elsewhere in Italy, and quickly surrounded the Anzio beachhead. And despite Allied air superiority, Kesselring was able to call upon several Luftwaffe squadrons who pummeled the beachhead and offshore shipping. Much of the success of Shingle had depended on the U.S. 5th and British 8th Armies along the Gustav Line being able to punch through the line, link up with the Anzio for forces, and head for Rome. In fact, the original plan called for the breakthrough at the Gustav Line before Shingle was even launched. Certainly, Lucas had no control over events happening 75 miles south of Anzio. As I said earlier, Lucas was given vague and contradictory orders. Clark had told him his main mission was to establish and secure a beachhead in Anzio, but he was also given the freedom to probe towards Rome and exploit any favorable situations. In fact, two recon probes, one British, one American, went all the way to Rome without encountering any opposition. 
But Lucas still feared that such a long and narrow salient that a full-scale drive on Rome would create could easily be attacked and destroyed. By the time enough reinforcements had arrived piecemeal over the next few months to make a drive on Rome possible, it was too late. The Germans had sealed the Americans and British into what the Nazi propagandist Axis Sallies called the world's largest self-sustaining prisoner of war camp. In his journal, Lucas made it clear that as far as he could interpret his orders, especially after Clark had told him not to stick his neck out and to forget this goddamn Rome business, the seizure of Rome was not his main objective. Establishing and holding a beachhead was. He would do exactly that and not do anything foolish that would cause the destruction of his command. He therefore decided to stay put and wait for more reinforcements and supplies to arrive. That decision cost him the element of surprise and ultimately his job. But I think that history has proved that by being cautious and not rushing to Rome, Lucas saved the Sixth Corps from destruction. I also wanted to expand on a few aspects of the operation that have gotten short shrift in previous books about Anzio. Topics such as the contribution of the black pilots known as the Tuskegee Airmen who helped defend the beachhead from the sky by engaging the German pilots who dared attack the allied forces at Anzio. I wanted to give credit to the Japanese Americans of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, which is a part of the Red Bull 34th Division, who were in the thick of fighting during the breakout in May. And Robert Fredericks combined US and Canada First Special Service Force, who were capable of performing incredible feats, but were not used anywhere near their capabilities. And Colonel Bill Darby on the right, the father of the American Rangers, and whose force was ambushed and all but wiped out during the battle for Chisterna. I wanted to tell the story of how a British Lieutenant Eric Fletcher Waters, the father of Pink Floyd's founder Roger Waters, died, and how his death inspired Roger to create the album and movie The Wall and the song When the Tigers Broke Free. I wanted to introduce readers to the innovative use of battle sleds during the breakout, in which Ernie Harmon's tanks literally dragged into battle the soldiers of the 3rd Infantry Division. I wanted to mention how even Mother Nature got involved in the battle with the eruption of Mount Vesuvius that put a U.S. Army airfield out of action. I wanted to explore how the brutal fight for Monte Cassino impacted the Anzio battle. Here's what the mountaintop abbey looked like after it was destroyed, and how it looks today in its fully restored state. I also wanted to give long overdue recognition to the brave nurses who performed their duties while under fire of the German guns and bombers close to the front and sometimes lost their lives in the performance of their duties. The lady down here in the lower right hand corner, do you recognize her? Avis Daggett Schorer, who is from this area and was a nurse at Anzio and was on the first panel that we did when we talked about, uh, uh, about Anzio. And uh, I was able to excerpt uh, considerable material from her memoirs that, that she had written after the war. I wanted to give credit to the chaplains who gave unstintingly of themselves to provide spiritual comfort to the troops at the front and the Italian civilians at Anzio and Nettuno and Aprilia and Cisterna, whose homes were destroyed and their lives forever changed by the battle, but who still thank the British and Americans for liberating them from the Germans. And the men of the graves registration units who had the unspeakably gruesome task of recovering the bodies of the fallen during brief lulls in the fighting. All their stories needed to be told. I also go into some depth by quoting the biographies of such famous combatants as Audie Murphy, who would go on to be the most decorated American soldier in World War II, and Minnesotan James Ornis, who was seriously wounded while fighting at Anzio. After recuperating, he gravitated to Hollywood, as I'm sure you all know, started acting, changed the spelling of his name, and became best known for his role as Marshal Matt Dillon in the TV series Gunsmoke. Surprisingly, there are very few written accounts by German soldiers, so I set out to try and find as many of those accounts as I could and include them in desperate valor. The Germans may have been the enemy, but they were also incre incredibly courageous. I also did my best to pay homage to the thousands of soldiers who, for the most part, never became famous, but who, by their courage, did their part to prevent a German victory at Anzio. 
often at the cost of their lives. I also tell the historic deeds of all 26 Americans who earned the Medal of Honor at Anzio and the two British soldiers who were awarded the Victory Cross, Victoria Cross. I take Mark Clark to task for his shameful efforts to keep the British from sharing in the liberation of Rome, wanting to keep that honor exclusively for the Americans. Today, the region has fully recovered from the war. Here's a look at Anzio's bustling harbor, ringed by fine seafood restaurants. In fact, here's my wife dining in one of those fine restaurants <laughs> during our most recent trip there. And she really wants to go back. <laughs> but maybe things have recovered a little bit too well at the expense of history. The men who engaged in the Titanic struggle have almost been forgotten. I'm profoundly disappointed by Italy's lack of proper monuments and memorials to those who fought there. This small sign at the overpass is one of the few markers that tell the average visitor that something of great historical importance happened here. And in fact, if you can't read the sign, Campo di Carne, the field of meat, is basically what it translates to. And in Italian, German, and English, it says, on this site, thousands of men fought and died. I don't think that's a sufficient memorial to what went on there. This is what the battlefield looked like 74 years ago, and here's what it looks like today. The hallowed ground desecrated by factories, shopping centers, apartments, car dealerships, and more. If you care anything about history and battlefield preservation, this should make you angry. It's only when one visits the vast American and British cemeteries here that one gains an appreciation for the tremendous loss and sacrifice and the courage that took place here in early 1944. If one looks hard enough, one can discover an out-of-the-way plaque or two that memorializes the soldiers and sailors who lost their lives at Anzio. For example, on this abandoned building near where the British troops came ashore is a plaque that gives a bit of its history. By the way, that uh, white plastic chair that you see in front is where Italian prostitutes sit while waiting for customers to drive by. Although there are very few monuments or memorials to the savage fighting that went on for 124 days, if you look hard enough, you can still manage to discover a few remnants of the battle, such as the damaged statue of St. Michael in front of the church in Aprilia, and this sh shrapnel damage behind the church, and this shot-up silo on a farm north of Aprilia, and this battle-scarred gatepost at Isola Bella, where the rangers were wiped out. For the most part, though, the traces of the monumental battle have been erased or built over. In closing, then, my main reason for writing this book was to portray Anzio not as a failed offensive, which it was, and is probably, for most of the historians who've written about it, the only view that they have, but as a triumphant defense on a par with the British stand at Rourke's Drift during the Zulu Wars in 1879, the Soviets' tenacious refusal to give up Stalingrad and Leningrad to the Germans, the Americans' dogged defense at Bastogne, the desperate fighting that swirled around and on top of Porkchop Hill in Korea, and the Marines' courageous defense at Quezon during the Vietnam War. I believe that Anzio should be seen as another Alamo, but one with a better outcome, a defensive stand where the heroic defenders not only hold off the attackers, but ultimately break out and defeat their enemy. I'm hard pressed to think of another battle with a similar outcome. In closing, you might be wondering, where did the title come from? I borrowed it from Winston Churchill, who, while commenting on the Anzio operation for which he was mainly responsible, wrote, but fortune, hitherto baffling, rewarded the desperate valor of the British and American armies. The fighting was intense, losses on both sides were heavy, but the deadly battle was won. I'm afraid I've only just scratched the surface of everything that's contained in desperate valor. I hope you'll read it and get the complete story of courage beyond measure, the story of desperate valor. Thank you very much. We have one veteran this evening, Don Halverson, who was in the 168th Infantry, 34th Division. Uh, Don, uh, <clears throat> Joined the 34th in Naples in October of 43. Uh, was uh, uh, 
was on a troop ship coming up with British that they dropped supplies at uh, Bari, uh, came up to a casino with uh, his, his uh, uh, heavy weapons. Uh, Don, t tell us about your experience coming into Italy and, uh, and then into Anzio. Our first main battle was after we left uh, Naples, there was three crossings of Alterno River. And after that was Mount Pantano, about the tallest mountain I climbed. And from there was the casino. We was only up there a couple of days and then was going up a ravine and running across to the castle that sat above the casino and broke daylight when the third platoon and my platoon got there and the Germans saw where he was coming from. And so they got most of my platoon wiped out. So I had five guys left to get over to the castle. And so by then we only had half the company left. So the captain called headquarters and they said, get the heck out of there tonight. So got out of there and got across the valley and the planes come over. Some of our planes, three of them flew over and they bombed the whole place right where we were in the castle. And we went back a ways and got on trucks, went back to Naples and got back a few of the guys that had minor injuries and a few replacements. And we loaded up on an LST and headed up uh, to Anzio. Kind of fun to watch the old Mount Vesuvius was erupting. That was quite a, quite a torch if you ever seen one. And then we landed at Anzio and that's Angie was all a bunch of ditches there that they used for a drainage system. That was our defense line. So I got rid of my mortars. I had six machine guns on. And that's where we camped out for four months. Nights, the night days, you stay under cover. And nights, everything broke loose. The patrols would go out. Our Germans come in and ours go out. And everything would open up. It was scary work there every night there for those four months. And then after, finally, when they had decided to break out, I, a bunch of the artillery armored outfit lined up behind us, and we heard they brought in a lot of artillery from, uh, just dug them in, and the morning that they, for the attack, I, you heard one boom, and after that it was just like thunder. They just dropped the shells ahead of us and just kept on lays them up and then the armor went through. And after that, we went up to a place we were supposed to go up to a little town where there was a bunch of buildings and went up a dry creek bed and we run a couple of miles to this dry creek bed and, and hitting the ground a few times. And by the time I got up there and thought I'd take a drink of water and my canteen was empty, a hole through it. <laughs> That's kind of close. And we followed this creek bed up to where all these buildings were, and a little bit more than what they said. There were a bunch of German tanks and German paratroopers. So we, one of our well, the radio. First of all, our radio man got killed, so that ruined the radio. So we had no contact with anybody. And one of the Cub planes come over and called back for our artillery and they dropped a smoke round close and the captain told them we got back a little ways and good thing he got his boy when the artillery made the cracks and they just leveled everything. And then that night then we took off for the hills, the Germans had pulled out and we took a zigzag ride up to the top of the hill and met all the troops that were coming up through Anzio. We all loaded up on everything that was moving and I went up to Rome. That was about it. Don, uh, went to Rome and headed on up to Pisa. Don, one one of the things you mentioned to me, uh -huh. uh, one of the things you mentioned on the phone when we were talking was the uh, those Anzio Annies, the big big artillery pieces. Yeah. Did did any of those land close to you? You betcha. <laughs> Describe the first, describe the first that landed about 20 30 yards in front of us. And you had to bury a hole, a car in the hole, and the second one was a dud that landed just a few yards and just pushed the dirt up underneath us. 600 pound shell. 
But that was uh, something to scary. It made the uh, barrels were smooth and the, and the uh, ribbing was on the shell. That's why they made so much noise. That's why we call them the Andrew Express because it sounded like a freight train coming. That's oh. why you, you could tell when it's coming every night. You see when it gets dark, or the, you see the flashing off when the shells are coming. And they had a kicker on it so that it explode above us there and kick the shells out in the harbor when they wanted to go farther for 38, 40 miles. That's what it was every night, just uh, tank fires back and forth, and rifle fires, platoons, it was scary. <laughs> okay, let, let, let's, let's stop there just a minute. Uh, uh, I, I wanna go to Jerry uh, Blomquist. Jerry was on our trip uh, to uh, uh, Italy a couple of years ago. Uh, his dad was in G Company, 179th, 45th Division. And uh, the thing that I want to give Jerry great credit for, uh, like so many veterans, his father didn't talk to him much about it. Jerry is a uh, hero of the Vietnam War. And I'm not sure, I guess we ne never talked about that, but uh, what prompted your interest uh, to find out about your dad? But he has made a, a great effort to learn about what his father didn't tell him. Jerry, can you tell us some of your, some of your research uh, about what happened to your dad? Yeah, like Don said, my dad never said anything to anybody in our family. I'm sure he talked to my mother and had some friends that he talked to. I said, I'm not sure if I'm coming through. <laughs> but uh, when my dad was alive, I was busy with a family and a career. And when things started settling in, I started getting interesting, interested in World War II history and his partaking in it. Well, he died in 1982. So I lost that opportunity. So anybody that does know a veteran, uh, I need to listen to my own preaching, but make sure you do talk to them and do it with patience and concern because it'll take a time. So my little preaching sermon there. But my dad shipped out on the 2nd of November and headed through di two different ports. They landed in North Africa, and then on December 29th, moved from there up to Italy. And we have been fortunate in that we have V-mail, and we have a lot of his letters that he was able to send during his period as a prisoner that we've been able to gather this from. The first reference that we have is on the 17th and 18th of January. There's a V-mail saying that he was in Italy. And the letter on the 18th, he notified my grandmother that he probably wouldn't write for a while because rumor had it that they would be moving out. Well, according to the history records in that, that following 20th and 21st, they did move out and the 179th landed at Anzio on the 23rd of January. So he didn't have long to wait. <clears throat> it appears that he moved in through Aprilia and went to the Mussolini Canal area and took up a defensive period there, defensive positions, and stayed there and waited to see what was going to happen. A side note, my dad was born on the 12th of February, 1924. Well, he was on the line just north of Aprilia, or off of Aprilia. He celebrated his 20th birthday. Now, I think I can think of a lot of other places I'd rather celebrate my birthday than there. As mentioned by Flint and other historians on the 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th, Kesselring and Mackinson threw a tremendous force against the Allies to try to push them back. Well, history says that companies F and G of the 179th 
we're kind of the brunt, one of the few brunt places, and we're, re we're hit very heavily. On the 16th of February, after that battle was going on, we started finding out from different pieces of email and our documents that my father had been captured. The battle there was so fierce in that and they got overrun and his unit gave up. I understand that it was pretty rough. <laughs> so from there, he was moved from the Anzio area up to northern Italy, and there, from northern Italy, went into southeast Germany to camps associated with Stalag 7A. Now, he was in transit camps and these 7A affiliations for about two months. And after that two months, he got assigned as a work detail and went to work on a farm about 25, 30 kilometers south of Munich. And he was able to spend the rest of his time as a prisoner of war until liberation, which would have been about 10, 11 months, working on this farm with a few other POWs. He was able to send quite a few letters, and people I've shown things to said he must have been doing something good because they never see that many letters come out from there. We have 14 postcards from the German Kriegs system and 15 letters. And the postcards and the letters are all very sanitized, call it. I'm well, I'm fed well, I'm doing this, things are good. Well, you knew it was gonna go through two censors, so you didn't say much. Only one letter was ever blacked out. So I guess he was a model letter writer. But uh, some of the things in his letter to kind of tell you what his PO experience was like, they received numerous Red Cross parcels. He talks about receiving Canadian, British, and U.S. Red Cross parcels. He preferred the British. He said they had better provisions than that. The only thing he liked about the U.S. ones is they had coffee. British and Canadians, I guess, don't drink coffee. He also comments about how interesting it is that you can take different ingredients that are in these packages and create a meal. So, and yet my wife reminded me of an antidote that my mother told me about. We never, ever, ever had pea soup in our house because my dad wouldn't allow it. <laughs> and the story seems to be that the military or the Germans' idea of pea soup was tying a string around a pea and dragging it through the water, and there you go. But we, I eat pea soup now, but we never did as young people. For the most part, he always talked that he was being treated well, that the family he was working for was nice, he was starting to learn their language and understand. He, he was fortunate in that this German family had a son that was a prisoner of war here in the U.S. So there was kind of a sympathy or whatever. And his, their son and my dad must have been of similar stature because we actually have three pictures from his time on the farm. One is with the farmer and the horses. One is with him and another prisoner of war there. And one is in their son's lederhosen. and they dressed them up and I don't know if dad was gonna try to fake everybody out and sneak away, but we have a picture of him in lederhosen. and never saw him in lederhosen after that either though. <laughs> so <laughs> he talks about receiving clothing from the Red Cross and that at one time he received a full dress uniform and he said it felt so good to be back in uniform. So there's that, that longing there that you're, you're not with your unit anymore. The only times that he really talked about not liking it on the farm is in, 
He said, after threshing, after fall plowing occurred, they went up into the mountains and did logging. And his comment there was, it's not the greatest thing, I guess a person has to like it. So, um, another comment, he, letter that he sent at Christmas, this is a sorry place to be spending it at. Well, I can understand that. Another incident that was interesting in his letter was there was a fellow POW there that was trying to teach my dad how to play the harmonica. And this fellow was from North Carolina. I never remember seeing my dad play the harmonica, so I guess he wasn't a good student. <laughs> but uh, about the, uh, his release, his uh, release from the farm, we have information, and I have his identity card that was issued in Munich on the 6th of May, 1945. And he was repatriated, I believe is the proper term, by U.S. forces that moved into southern Germany and went through there. So he was, it was a good group to be released by. <laughs> He returned back here to the States on the 1st of June, 1945, and married my mother and raised three kids, and we're very lucky, I think, that he did make it to a, a POW camp, and more so that he made it to a farm, because there's lots of people that died in battle, lots of people that died in camps, a lot of people that were mistreated, and he was very fortunate, so that's Thanks, much Jerry. It. <laughs> that's great. And, and again, I, I, Jerry's message is so important for you veterans to talk to your family. Uh, I, I just have such great admiration for the effort that Jerry's put into uh, learning about his father's experience. I want to contrast that with Laura Shippey. Uh, <clears throat> The, the first Ranger Battalion, I don't know the numbers, but well over half of it uh, came out of the 34th Division because Darby was the aide-de-camp of the division commander and uh, organized the first Ranger Battalion. Uh, the first Ranger Battalion went into uh, northern uh, Africa, captured uh, the, uh, the coastal batteries at Arzu, and uh, went forward uh, with such great success that they then took the cadre from the 1st Battalion, formed the 4th and 6th Battalions, 4th and 3rd fourth, fourth and and Battalions, and um, uh, went into Sicily, went into Salerno, and uh, uh, when you study Salerno, uh, I've gotten a, a lot of background from these uh, rangers. The rangers used to have, and I think it was the first Saturday of every month, the rangers got together and had breakfast together. And that's where I got to know Laura and her father, Zane. Laura, tell us your dad's experience briefly from... Uh, Africa and on into Cisterna. Um, it was kind of amazing. They finished their training. They were trained by the uh, commandos, British commandos. It took six weeks, and then it was no ma more than two weeks, and they landed in our zoo. They'd done their job very well because they were waiting on the beaches for the first to land. They took care of the batteries. They took care of the, any resistance. They kind of, from there, they, the rangers were a specialty group. I mean, they sent them out. Lots of times they operated behind enemy lines looking for the Germans, for their placements of their artillery. So, I mean, they were kind of out on their own. Then they really never really knew where they were. One time they got shot at by their own planes and they shot one down because <laughs> there was no way to communicate. 
so they put an Air Force, they've put an Air Corps guy with them for a while and they figured out smoke signals. So the Air Corps guys wouldn't get shot and the Rangers wouldn't get shot. <clears throat> One interesting thing that did happen to my parents, uh, they'd gone over to the Philippines to visit my sister and then she took her to the, they, she took them to the war memorial. And there was a guy that was standing there looking at all the names and my dad went over there. And he says, are you looking for a friend? And he says, no, I was looking for my brother. He died here. And dad says, well, did you fight in the, in the Philippines? And he says, no, I was in North Africa. And my dad's going, okay. This guy was from Australia. And they got to talking. Well, when they were in North Africa, they would meet up with a Australian group in the night at a certain place. And if the Australians got there first, they made tea. If the Americans got there, they made coffee. This guy was one of the guys. Oh. You know, of all the places in the world to be, in the Philippines, <laughs> my dad didn't, I mean, that was not his forte, but he wanted to see my sister, to meet the guy, a guy that he had met in the desert. And it was just kind of this whole um, working or talking to my dad and learning about the people and stuff. We've just been so fortunate. There's been so many unusual things that have just kind of coincided. Um, my dad was shot. Well, they went through North Africa. They were with Patton in El, in El Guitar. And then they went to Sicily, and the one thing he did tell me about there, they didn't take a bath for a whole month. He says the clothes would stand up by themselves. They didn't have to lay down. And then they went to, to uh, Italy, and he was shot in Venifro, and he was shot pretty bad. He lost a lung and had a lot of shrapnel. And they sent him back to North Africa. Well, about a week before he figured out he was getting discharged, he went AWOL from the hospital because he wanted to get back to his unit and because he knew they were going to Anzio. And it was kind of a, it was one of the kind of jokes. Basically, he went down to the docks. He got on an Italian ship. They got him to Naples. And then as soon as he got off the boat, the MPs picked him up because he was AWOL. And they threw him in a stockade with a bunch of other American uh, rangers. And the MP just looked at him and said, you damn rangers never know when to stay out of it, do you? <laughs> we were up in Anzio uh, at the time, so they went down and got us one morning, put us on a boat, and we were in Anzio. I was strolling around Anzio one morning and ran into Darby. He looked at me and said, Shippy, what in the hell are you doing here? You're AWOL. This was before Casterna. This was just right at the beginning. Yeah, I said, what do you mean I'm AWOL? I'm back in my outfit. Yeah, he said, I see. How can I be AWOL then? Oh, he said, I'll get rid of that. And he went through the other rangers, told them all the same thing, sent them back to their units. Well, he was up on the line. Uh, that was like two or three days after Anzio happened. They sent him back. He went up back on the line. And then three days later, he got shot. So they sent him down to the hospital on the beach. And the doctor fixed it up. It was a um, clear shot right through the upper thigh, bandaged up. The guy, the doctor said, "Well, we, we want to stay over. We want you to stay overnight with us." And he goes, "Oh no." He goes, "One of my friends got down here wounded, and he got wounded twice when they got bombed." He says, "I'm out of here." He got on a jeep, went back up to the lines again. It was not a safe place. To Safer stay. online than in uh, the hospital. Yeah. Uh, the sad part was, you know, when he was in the 4th Ranger Battalion and when the 1st and the 3rd were nailed, I mean, they listened to the radio transmissions. There's nothing they could do. I mean, they were trying, but they couldn't get through. Uh, Darby listened to the calls for help and the guys finally said, you know, we'll do our damnedest. And they did. 747 some guys were killed or captured, and three or four of them came back through the lines. They took the rangers off the line after the, Sterner. they finished all that, and the guys with the points to go home went home. My dad was one of them. 
Um, he was very bitter because he wanted to be a 30-year man. They sent him to uh, uh, Fort Butler. First day, first day, there was 199 of them. The first day they went to the mess hall, they walked in and all these Italian prisoners were running around free. There was just about a massacre in the mess hall and the colonel at the, the ran the fort finally just moved the Italians to another area as long as the rangers were there. And then um, they had an interesting bet. One, the guy that was in charge of the, the rangers, they were talking to the guy that was in charge of the fort. And he goes, oh yeah, he says, my guys are done. They're ready to ship overseas. And uh, you know, it said something about the rangers. And he says, oh no, nah. he says, they're ready. They made a bet that the rangers could capture the fort by 11th, by, by midnight. Uh, and the fort was put on full alert. They had a gun to the head of the commander at 11.35, and he surrendered. Those guys went through another six weeks of basic training. So, so anyways, Dad finally, they uh, just, he finally was, re was released, basically, and came home. Uh, his, mom, his mom was told he was dead when he was shot. It was about two weeks later she found out he was alive. But it was too late because his dad had already signed up in the Army or up in the Navy and he was gone to the Navy. But he couldn't get out. It was too late. Dad went, came back home and life was hard. I mean, he was bitter. He was depressed. Uh, the only job he could find was in a sheep kill at a packing plant. He finally ended up working for the airlines because he'd been trained as a radio man. And he worked for the airlines for 33 years. Uh, and we, us kids, like I said, we found out little pieces of things, and the things that we found out were kind of scary. But the, the, the best part of the story, I mean, he was a great father. Uh, he was a, an amazing man. He was able to compartmentalize his life. And if anybody asked about the war, he says, that's part of my life. It's over. I move forward. And it wasn't until in 83 I tricked him into going to a, a reunion of the Rangers. I was, I was in Waukesha, Wisconsin, met the sheriff, retired sheriff there. He was a ranger. He asked me about my dad, and we talked. Well, I asked my parents to come up for a weekend, which they did, and took him over to the ranger reunion. The sheriff was waiting outside the door. He grabbed my dad. My dad goes, what's this all about? I said, you know what? You guys are here. I'm gone. I'll see you in a couple hours. Left him there, and he reconnected with his with rangers. I mean, they walked in, the first man he seen, my dad looked at him, the guy looked at my dad and goes, I thought you were dead. Well, I thought you were dead. They had no clue that they were both still alive. And it was from that time on until he passed away that he went to every ranger reunion. And I think that was probably the most healing part was he was able to be at peace. And for, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of them left. Um, my brothers and my sister finished the trip. They had gone, uh, not this year, but the year before, they, on Memorial Day, they were in Anzio at the cemetery. <clears throat> my brother had brought some of my dad's ashes with him. And he asked the gal, if you, if you know where there's a ranger buried that's from Iowa, and the girl goes, well, yeah. And Dick Kurt told them what they wanted to do. They found the guy from Iowa, and my brother put those ashes there. So that was the close on my dad's chapter. chapter. And, uh, Great story. Huh? Great story. I mean, he, because we'd ever asked, do you want to go back? He says, what the hell for? I, he, there was no way he was going back there. Uh, but anyways, that was, you know, I felt that was, that was just a good close on his his life, and uh, so yeah, he's he was a pretty amazing man. And the one thing that I did learn, we had a surprise 80th birthday for him, and we'd had uh, guys he'd worked with at the airport come, and there was three guys that we knew as kids because we used to go out to the airport and visit my dad. Um, they came and sat down at my ta at our table, and he goes. He said, Laura, he says, there's something we got to tell you. 
about your dad. And I thought, oh my God, what, what did he do? You know, uh, they were three Vietnam War veterans. And that's, my dad had quite a few of them at work. Um, he says, I want you to know that your dad saved our lives. And I looked at him, I'm going, what are you talking about? He says, we came back. He says, we were spit on. And he says, if it wasn't for your dad, he says the three of us would either be dead or in jail or drug addicts. He listened when we needed somebody to talk to and he kicked ass when he had to. And I, you know, because you think of your dad as your dad. And that was just like, I, I didn't know what to tell him. I mean, that was my dad. He seemed to, I mean, there was friends of my brothers too that would, had been in Vietnam, and they'd just call my dad up and say, Do you, are you gonna be home this weekend? Well, yeah. Well, can I come and talk to you? Yeah. So I, apparently he's hel he helped a lot of people that, I mean, of course he would never tell us that. But, you know, uh, the veterans have a lot to offer. And, kid, I, mean, I mean, from the time my dad came home in 44, until 83, that part of his life was over. And it wasn't until after that when he hooked up with his ranger friends that, his, that he could close that life and move on. But then he made a lot of difference to other, a lot of people because he could talk to them. He knew, like, he, like the guy told me, he says he knew when to listen, he knew when to kick her asses. And that, I think, is uh, quite a tribute. And I'm sure there's a lot of veterans out there who have put themselves in the same line. And uh, when you talk to a veteran, don't push. They'll, they'll talk when they're ready. But, you know, it takes a long time to heal. So. Great. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> I, I want to add a uh, little story that uh, piggybacks on Flint's comments and, and Laura's. Uh, when we did our trip uh, in 15, was it? We went to Cisterna and we saw the, the draw that the Rangers came up. Uh, we were on this big black bus. I went up to, uh, and, and Flint showed the, the, the pillars leading into the villa. That was all that was left and they're bullet ridden. But there's been some newer houses built on either side of them. And I went up and knocked on the door, uh, not speaking any Italian, but uh, you know, I'm an American, we're here, our bus is out here. And this guy stopped. He went back into his house and he, he, was, he farmed the area where Laura's f f uh, dad had fought. He brought this handful of cartridges. He said, every year when I plow my field, and we, we, we had a translator, he didn't speak uh, English, I didn't speak Italian, but we had some Italian help on the bus. Every year I, I, I continued to pick up and plow up these cartridges, take them with you. I. Um, uh, you know, TSA, you can't take cartridges anymore. <laughs> I, I regret that so much. But as we were loading on the bus, this is still an emotional thing for me. He ran back into his house and he brought these two big jugs of water, got on the bus and gave the water to us and says, Viva America for freeing us in Italy. So, Don, what you did, Jerry, what your dad did, Laura, what your dad did, is still recognized by some of the Italians and the evidence of the battle. Uh, I, I, one question I'm gonna ask Flint when we go into the Q&A here momentarily is why Italy doesn't memorialize battlefields like you see in especially Belgium and Luxembourg. But that's, that's, I want you to answer that as our first question as we go into that. But uh, uh, if, please go to Cisterna, 
knock on those doors again. I, I, I don't know that I'll ever lead another trip to Italy, but that was such a uh, great thing. And uh, Jerry, I, I, it, was, it was so important for you to be on that trip with us that time. Good. When we were in Aprilia too, it shows you that the Italian people of that town really still remembered and welcomed what happened because we were a group of about 24, I believe. Well, after they had this small ceremony by the statue that you saw in those red circles, I don't think you got them all because there was a lot of damage to that statue. But our entire group was taken about a block and a half away to a cafe where we, we could have had, I think, anything we wanted. <laughs> but they treated us very, very well. So it's nice to see that. Yeah, the American the soldier is a great today. ambassador for our country. No question about it. OK, Don's question was, why doesn't Italy memorialize um, their battlefields the way some other countries do and the way we do here for our Civil War? Battlefields, and I think the main reason is because they were on the other side for the first um, several years of the war. The Mussolini and Hitler were you know, like that, and um, it wasn't until the invasion of, of Sicily that um, finally the Italian king, King Victor Emmanuel III, um, basically kicked. Uh, Mussolini out of the position as dictator, and they made a secret pact with the Allies to go in. You know, they were going to be neutral, but they would also help the Allies. There were several uh, Italian divisions and battalions that threw in their lot with the Americans and the British and uh, the Partisans. About 50,000 Italian civilians joined the ranks of the Partisans to uh, fight the Germans. And I think they're embarrassed by that, just like uh, in parts of France, because um, the fact that they were conquered by the Germans, they, they you know, see that as kind of a dark spot in French history. And um, I think that's the main reason. Listen, we're going to do some uh, Q&A here. I'm going to walk up this aisle. And Chris, if you'll take that one. Uh, do I see a hand? Right here. Here's the mic. Yeah, this is for uh, Flint, and I really enjoyed your uh, talk. But let me ask you a totally unfair what-if question. Assuming that the Allies hadn't landed at Anzio, what should they have done? Landed somewhere else, put all their resources on the Gustav line, or as some have suggested, just say, we don't need all of Italy. What we have is good enough, uh, air bases, et cetera. Let's, uh, devo let's go somewhere else. Well, I, I think the, um, the fight not only at the Gustav line, but also at Anzio were, was important to keep the Germans pinned down in Italy so that they couldn't send other troops to the Eastern Front or to bolster the Normandy Front. Um, and you know, in a way, even, even though the whole Italian campaign has kind of a, a taint of failure on it, which it shouldn't have, in my opinion, uh, there was still the sense that we're going to be supporting the war effort by tying up as many German divisions as we can here in Italy. Your other part of the question about if they hadn't gone to Anzio with the amphibious end run, where should they have gone? And, and probably the answer would have been just to stay at the Gustav line and continue to pound away at the Germans until they finally cracked it. But, you know, they've been doing that for several months without success and uh, losing a lot of men in the process. So, you know, it, it wasn't a, a, a situation where there was a clear answer or a good solution. But, but Flat, something that I would add, and I haven't looked at that completely, but uh, when you get north of there, you don't have very good landing beaches. I mean, the best landing beaches were there at, at uh, Anzio and Naterno. So. Right. Right. So sometimes the terrain dictates those decisions. The question here, sir. If uh, Lucas wouldn't have stopped, if he would have, he only had two divisions, but if he would have continued on towards Rome, would he have just been cut off and uh, 
annihilated, or could he have held that position? Well, in my opinion, um, he would have formed a salient from the beachhead, running up the only paved highway from Anzio to Rome, and Kessel Ring could have attacked him from both sides and just chopped up the, uh, the attacking force. Uh, and even if they did get to Rome, they wouldn't probably have had enough uh, strength left to, uh, to defend Rome if the Germans decided they wanted to take it back. Question here. Uh, yes, I have an opinion on the bombing at Monte Cassino because my uncle happened to have been a pilot, but I've had people highly criticize the Americans for bombing the heck, you might say, out of Monte Cassino. And what is your response to that? Um, that is viewed as one of the tragic aspects of the Italian campaign, the fact that this 800-year-old monastery was destroyed um, for no good reason. The Allies believed that the Germans were using it as an observation post to look down into the, into the valley below in the town of Casino, and uh, then they could call artillery fire down on it. And uh, it wasn't until the, the abbey, the monastery, was actually destroyed that the Germans did move into it and use it as a defensive position. But faulty intelligence led to that decision. It was actually a South African general who was given the task in one of the four assaults on Monte Cassino. Uh, he said, well, I'm, I'm not going to risk my men's lives as long as the monastery is up there looking down our throats. And so it was, Clark has been blamed for that uh, particular destruction when he really had no part in making the decision. It was this South African general and General Alexander who authorized the, the bombing of the monastery. Okay. So in reality, it was kind of a mistake because they did think that that was being used and it really didn't turn out to be used until afterwards. Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, I'm going to throw a question to Don because you were fighting there at Casino. Tell us what you saw looking up at the uh, casino uh, as a guy in the valley. I tell, them, tell the audience what you saw when you were down below casino. What, what kind of terrain and enemy fortifications did you see up there? Well, we had everything zeroed in. We got up there. Well, that's just the way it got us there. When we got up the ravine, as soon as it broke daylight, they dropped all the mortars on us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, question, Chris. Don, when you were up in Casino, Don, <clears throat> uh, when you're fighting Casino, it's a big L, and it's very narrow on top and very rocky. Can you tell how you tried to advance? Because with all the rocks, it would be very easy for the Germans to defend. So how did you, how did you advance up, up that hill? Did, did you... Uh actually advance on the abbey or just the castle? No, we're just by, we were only up there a couple of days. There, there, are, there are two structures on the mount. Uh, the castle the sat above the casino and the monastery was back on a hill here. We run across, and we just run across to the castle there and when we had all our casualties, why we pulled out that night and that's when they bombed it. So they didn't actually get to the monastery on time. Yeah, we weren't at the monastery. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on Clark and going into Rome in the manner in which he did? You want me to talk about that? Um, Clark and Alexander had a very contentious relationship, just as Montgomery and Patton had a contentious relationship. Um, and I think it was what, what Clark had done to shut out the British from sharing in, this, in the victory uh, was out of spite. Uh, he didn't like Alexander. He didn't think that the British troops were as good as the American troops. And he, wanted, he, was a, he was an egoist. He, he really thought of himself as something special. Uh, during, the, during the war, he put out a, a, 
an order to all the army photographers, never take a picture of me from the right side, only the left, that's my good side. And, and that gives you an idea of his personality. And uh, he wanted to be known as the conqueror of Rome, and he wanted the Americans to be the sole uh, liberators uh, of the city. And because of that, uh, I think there was some bad blood that uh, boiled up as a result. Uh, relative to uh, Monte Cassino, you showed a photograph of the uh, uh, monastery completely restored. Uh, have you any idea how much of the original medieval architecture was still there and available to reconstruct that? How much of it is new yeah. and how much of it is ancient? Yeah, I, I can't give you an exact figure, but I know they tried to use as much as the original stone as possible. If you visit the place, you'll see walls that look kind of like a patchwork, where there's new stone and there's old stone, and uh, the old stone has pock marks in it from the, the shrapnel from the bombings and the shellings. Um, but they have, as far as I can tell, followed the original uh, pre-war uh, version of, of what the monastery looked, at, looked like. And, it's an amazing, how many people have ever been to Monte Cassino? Okay, about a quarter of the audience here. Um, and, and I think it, it's, you really have to, you know, uh, realize how much was damaged and how, how well they have put it back together. It's, I think they had a UN um, grant to help restore it and it was, it's, it's a, a wonderful, uh, almost a sacred place to visit. It really is. really is. Uh, Paul, Paul. Paul, Thompson. Say, I want you, to, you and Jerry to connect up. Paul's going to be one of our veterans in December. He was in the Battle of the Bulge, captured at Gross Langenfeld. And, and uh, you guys compare... Uh, your, your, he was in a POW camp, your dad was. So see if there's uh, any connection there. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Patton. Uh, to the general audience that's available here witnessing these speakers, I, I'm here personally because of my relatives serving during World War II, and unfortunately they're not here. But the fact of knowing their past accomplishments and what you folks up there in, in the stage have acknowledged about your family and your friends and your comrades, and also to Mr. Flint, I'd like to mention that uh, Mr. Halverson at the State Fair was the representative for the 75th anniversary of World War II. And he was accomplished with uh, the general of the 34th Infantry Division and also with Bill Pop that emceed the program. And when you think of all the Minnesotans that could have been available for that, I think Mr. Halverson represented very well of what the World War II combat veteran for the state of Minnesota have accomplished. And they couldn't have picked a better person to attend that event. So thank you, Don. Uh, my question is, what was armored warfare like in Italy, especially compared to France, uh, especially for the Americans? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the question was, what was armored warfare like in Italy compared to places such as France? Um, I think uh, in Italy, because of the mountainous terrain, uh, it was, armored warfare was very restricted, that you had to stay on the roads. Uh, at Anzio, the, the fields had turned to mud. There were no roads. <laughs> yeah, the, the shelling had just, you know, churned everything up, and then if you had, took a tank off of the road, it would get immediately bogged down. Uh, in, in France, in Belgium, in Holland, in Germany, the, the land is much flatter, much op more open, much better tank country. 
Uh, in Italy, if you tried to get up a mountain road with a, t with a line of tanks, all the Germans had to do was blow out the first one to stop the whole uh, convoy of tanks. So there, there was you know, yeah, just night like, and day. Just like the rainy month in November, nothing worked. <laughs> it yeah, was all mud. The, the rainy months, it just turns everything to mush. Um, I, um, I, I really appreciate all of you coming this evening. Uh, Don, I want to ask one question. How yes. old are you? Huh? How old are you? 96. 96. <laughs> and um, one of the things that Don told me that I'd like for you to tell the audience, when you heard about VE Day, you were up in northern Italy. Tell me what, uh, t tell the audience what you told me on the phone. What, what did you do when you heard about the victory in Europe? No, what? The victory in Europe. What, what did, did you, you do? At that point. I'm good. When we hit the, <laughs> uh, I, did, on did, did, May 2nd of 45, when we hit the Swiss border, right, the captain got the call that the war was over. And what Looked did you do? Nice blue sky down the lake down there. We all stripped off our clothes and jumped in the lake. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had a bath for six months. <laughs> That's one thing about the Army with our November was a rainy month, so we got a shower in November is 43 and one in 44. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, waste water. Your, your long johns were a little bit, uh, you know, Stiff. raunchy. <laughs> and uh, I, I think the other thing, if any of you, uh, being a Texas boy, the first time I jumped into uh, Lake Superior in J May, I, I, uh, when Don told me that story, I, uh, uh, it, it was, can I say it was a jolt? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Uh, again, the books are up here. If you'd like to come down and visit with our veterans, see you next month. There's our program for next time. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.